what we do in our institute is evolutionary anthropology, and that's a two-step process. The first step is to say, what really are humans? How do we define humans, and how do we compare ourselves with what came before us, and how do we do that? We look at humans and then see how human behavior compares with that of at least our closest living relatives, the great apes, and in particular these, uh, the chimpanzee species, uh, bonobos and chimpanzees, and then hope that we can somehow identify the derived traits of humans, because that's what we find most interesting, the things that make us uniquely different from those other great apes. And that is Zurich by night, for those of you who don't, not from here. Is this representative for humans? And the answer, of course, is, well, not really. If you're into evolutionary psychology and believe in mismatch and those kinds of things, you realize that we should look for these guys first and then see if we can understand modern humans. So let's build in some stage in between because it's getting to be very complicated if you want to jump straight from orangutans to Zurich. Let's look at what we think is sort of the ancestral state, is what a biologist would say. Again, we have to be careful. These guys are not the perfect window on the Pleistocene, obviously. Based on 50 years of primate studies and 50 years or maybe somewhat shorter of forager studies who became more and more quantitative over the last few decades, we can draw up a list of what we think is different between humans and non-human primates and in particular our ancestor, the last common ancestor with the great apes, the other great apes. So we've developed a totally new lifestyle which has an element in there of systematic food sharing which is extremely important, the key to understanding human behavior I think. Cooperative breeding in which everybody in the group helps to feed and take care of the young ones. We have cumulative culture apes have culture. I'm proud to report, but they don't have cumulative <coughs> culture. They get stuck at a very low level. Every ape can in principle learn everything that is done in his or her community. In our case, that's uh, really, you know, I couldn't make this chair, and I didn't, you know, let alone these things that we're dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, we assume that the, the active participation by role models has played a, 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 a big role in the in the start of that whole process. So instead, where, where great apes are just passively allowing others to learn, humans are actively transmitting their knowledge. Our life history has become quite different. We have evolved this, for a biologist, almost unexpected phenomenon of midlife menopause. In other words, that we have grandmothers who are not having children themselves, but looking after children of their children. And um, we have the much higher birth rates than the great apes, which probably has something to do with the cooperative breeding. Pair bones arose that aren't there in the common ancestor. In humans, the children are being provisioned by both parents, obviously, but especially also by men, and that's a new element here. We are extremely cooperative. If you look at the hunter-gatherers, and I'll show you one or two more examples, we call this behavior proactive prosociality, based on what psychologists say. This is very similar to what the economists call other regarding preferences. So basically, you want to be just nice to others. It is unsolicited. We also have feelings of fairness. We are engaged lots in collective action. It's a bit of a hodgepodge here. But the point is that we are highly, highly cooperative. And of course, almost forgot, we're very clever. So here is what we have, roughly, that's different from between humans and apes. And the idea is that maybe it all depends on this ecology. So let's look at that ecology a little bit more. What we see, in other words, is cooperative breeding, cooperative hunting, and cooperative gathering. And all this stuff is prefaced by cooperative. So the whole ecology that we have has a strong element of working together as a collective unit or helping others by sharing and even actively provisioning. So these are clear differences with great apes because the apes are basically independent. I always say that the the, the ape females are single moms, right? Or allein erziehende Mütter in German. And human foragers are never allein erziehende. They always have support. That somebody always helps or a whole camp helps them. The reason 
of course, that they have all this help is the interdependence. The interdependence, I think, is sort of the, the key to understanding forager social systems. Suppose I'm a hunter. I hunt, and most of the time I come home with nothing. I still want to eat, but there's always somebody coming home with something, and then we share. Let's explain this. Where does this come from? How does it hang together? What, why did evolution put these features into place rather than others? And one of the more powerful tools we have for that is the comparative method. So we're, we're really thoroughly biological in that respect. The comparative method goes like this. So you say you have a species here, species I, that evolved something that is very different from the surrounding species. We hope that there are lots of examples, if you cast a net widely enough, of other species elsewhere in the big phylogenetic tree that evolved the same thing. <coughs> And that gives you a nice big sample to test hypotheses with. The problem with humans, of course, is that a lot of what we have seems to be totally unique. So you can't really talk about anything being uh, uh, shared with others. One of the things we claim is that we probably overestimated some of these unique things, and we should look more carefully at things that we do share with others. For instance, what you expect is that cooperative hunting put in place psychological predispositions to say, oh, as soon as I see others, I'd like to hunt. We actually see that much of the, many of these cooperative hunters, they sort of, they mill around a bit, they get restless, and then they all take off. Cooperative hunting only works if you then subsequently share the food. Sharing of food could, for instance, have led to the psychological need for fairness. That if you're not sharing fairly, then you're in trouble, because next time, you're not going to hunt with somebody anymore. What we focused on, though, was the other side, and we've done a lot of work on this, the cooperative breeding idea. Again, lots of other animals do that. What you expect are things like high social tolerance among the individuals. If you're not tolerant, you can't be a cooperative breeder. Also, a high responsiveness to when others need to be fed, for instance, or need to be protected, that you respond to that. And probably the smartest thing to do for that is just to be proactively Pro-social. In other words, not wait until somebody asks you. For instance, provisioning would be difficult if you wait until somebody asks you for food because that you've just gone out and come back, right? So the, the best thing is, to, I would like to give food to these individuals, and with that in mind, I go forward and then come back. That's sort of the idea. Uh, and in primates, we have this one family of the Calatrichidae, the little... Um, monkeys from South America that are cooperative breeders and we used initially as our model system and then expanded it. We see in them a breeding pair with sexually mature non-reproductive offspring. So basically you see this is one family group and they can go up to 10 or 12 or 15 even in the wild. Fathers of course help which is good but that's not cooperative breeding yet but also older offspring help which makes it cooperative breeding. And what do they do? They share food they share infant carrying duties. In fact, after giving birth, mom hardly ever carries the infants anymore. That's usually on daddy or one of the other helpers. So suppose you have some kind of cooperative behavior. Now this goes back to the good old Nico Tinbergen who made this distinction 50 years ago, almost to the day, and it's very valuable distinction. Selection for a function, so cooperative breeding or cooperative hunting, is always selection on a mechanism. And let's look at that. So for instance, if you look at the behavior, you can ask, what is it for in terms of its function? Does it improve reproductive success, survival? How does it do that? What is the function of this behavior? So for instance, it is to feed somebody else's offspring. So those we call the ultimate causes or ultimate aspects of the behavior. What is it good for? It's a why question. The other side is how does it work? We call that proximate causes. That's really about the mechanisms of the behavior. You could look at that at various levels. You could look at neuroendocrine mechanisms. You could look at genetics. But uh, most of the time, we look at what we call motivations, stuff we measure experimentally that are hypothetical black box kinds of variables. The point is that if selection likes a particular function, it has to put in place the mechanisms that support that function. So really, if, say, we are cooperative breeders or cooperative hunters, 
that should have led to some very specific mechanism. We try to do experiments that enable animals, individuals, to just help other individuals. No solicitation. You design it so that there's no reciprocation. And this is what happens if you do. So we have a setup here where you can draw, you can pull food. But the food is over here, so if you pull, somebody else will take it. And you see what will happen in this particular case. This is not group service, right? This is not altruism. Now look at these guys. These are archaeotrichid monkeys. The previous ones were a macaque, Japanese macaque. Those were not cooperative breeders. These are. So if you do this for a lot of species, we've now done 15 species, including humans. What you see is that the extent of elder maternal care predicts the percent of trials in which they actually pull food for somebody else, right? Not for yourself, for somebody else. You see there's a very strong correlation. Here's humans, and we took children, and there's been some very nice review work lately that suggests that it's really sort of something innate in human children that they just want to help without being requested. The idea is now that we find an element in human behavior that can be traced to the origin of cooperative breeding and that seems to be, I wouldn't say hardwired, but has a pretty strong basis in humans. And that is linked to our cooperative behavior. You can do this analysis, and then so here is our prosocial stuff. You can look at other things as well. We haven't done that in such detail because you realize this was several years of work, that one graph. You can do the same thing for cooperative hunting, and maybe there the reputation and the fairness, the allocentric inequity version of The Economist comes in. Basically what you do here is you say, if evolution favors a particular lifestyle, it must equip the animals that do that, in this case humans, with particular motivations, particular psychological predisposition to make that lifestyle work, otherwise it doesn't work. That list that I showed you earlier, now I highlighted in red, all the aspects that have to do with cooperative breeding and hunting, and you see that's almost everywhere. So it looks like we're onto something about what it is that humans are like. So here's what humans were like for a very long time. No one knows exactly when it started, but it could have been Homo erectus 1.8 million years ago. And what you see is that these mobile foragers, macro bands, we used to call them, um, have pretty much no social stratification. They're very egalitarian. Everybody's the same. It's largely monogamous. There's some polygyny. Nobody cares whether it is or not, but it's, it's very rare. In, in fact, it's just a few percent. Males aren't hanging out in kin groups as strongly as they do in some other societies. So there's no elite, obviously, no monopoly on force. Everybody is their own policeman, and so on. Now, if you look at what happened since then, is first thing is that people became more sedentary in places. Then we invented fruit production, either by being pastoralist or being agriculturalist. And then we invented states and empires. Now that, of course, is all pretty recent. And it's also true that most people were still uh, uh, nomadic mobile foragers. Only in the best few places were they sedentary. The same thing, agriculture didn't, it started, but in the beginning, most people were still foragers. This is a relevant point because it raises the question, did selection have time to change our psychology? You get increasing social stratification in this direction. You get increasing polygyny. You get increasing what you might call patriarchy. So men hanging together with their male relatives. You get hereditary classes, you know, kings and their son, who's the next king. And you get the elite trying to monopolize force in society. And all of that was fairly recent. And basically, what you got is a big shift from cooperation to competition, where I would argue that the underlying psychology didn't have time to catch up. There's always some competition among foragers, of course. But the 
we, we still need this cooperation, and if we don't have it, we are in trouble. That would be my argument here. The reason I say this is that there's several reasons, several signs that suggest that we're still deep down very cooperative. So for instance, we have what's known as cooperative eyes. Uh, we're the only species of primate where everybody can see where I'm looking. The reason is that we do a lot of this joint attention that it is important for you to see where I'm looking. In other species, if you look at me straight in the eyes, it's a threat. So this strongly suggests that we are, that our morphology there betrays cooperation. The other thing is, the stupidest thing to do. We blush. Darwin even blushed. Blushing is a sign of shame. If we are a competitive species, you would never show that. You don't show your injuries. You don't show these kinds of social faux pas. Well, there are no social faux pas in the first place because might is right. We use signals that were originally, that started out as subordination signals that became reassurance signals. So from the dominant, it became used by the uh, from, from the subordinate, it became used by the dominant to reassure other individuals. And, and we also use laughter to create relaxed atmospheres and so on. All that suggests that we have this deep history of egalitarianism. We have this need for security. Hunter-gatherers have this tremendously because remember when they're incapacitated, somebody needs to take care of them. There is a beautiful work by Wilkinson and Pickett who went through almost everything that you think is good or bad about people and it is linked to inequality of the society people live in. They looked at states within the USA, they also looked at countries across the world, and they corrected for things like median income and all that, of course. Basically what you find is that <coughs> physical and mental health is linked to inequality. Lower life expectancy linked to higher inequality. Violence linked to higher inequality. Here's an example of a recent paper that they did. Income inequality, so from low to high, age-adjusted death rate in cities, and you see that there's a pretty strong correlation. This is all epidemiological stuff, so you have to be very careful, but it looks like inequality kills. It's bad for you. Why would it be bad for us? After all, we're all capitalists nowadays. It suggests that we still, deep down, have a physiology and a psychology that is egalitarian. In conclusion, we were foragers, and we depended on cooperation. If you're not nice, you don't cooperate, you're a dead man as a forager. So, you know, you better be nice. Now, in the last 10,000 years approximately, but again, not everybody to the same extent at the same time, we created incentives for competitive behavior. Because of the sedentism and, and food production, you, you could get stores, you could get valuable land, stuff that you can monopolize, you can defend, and that creates an incentive for competition. And basically, whoever does that well, does better. So you would expect selection to actually favor these tendencies, but maybe it hasn't happened long enough yet, because it's very recent, that this is where culture comes in. This is cultural evolution, probably more than biological evolution. It's a guess. But the last two slides I showed you, the fact that morphologically we haven't changed, that we still all blush, and the fact that we still do well under egalitarian systems in terms of health and mental health, suggests that it was too fast for selection to catch up with us. Until here it was science, now I'm becoming an advocate. I would argue that if our goal is to maximize well-being, that maybe we should find the right balance between cooperation and competition and basically you can you can basically pick your life expectancy that you want and then say okay this is a society we need to go with that but that sounds too much like social engineering and this is the place to stop obviously thank you